here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. We are recording this episode on December 1st and major indexes just posted their biggest November rallies in years and uh, that was on hopes that the Fed will start cutting rates next year uh, because inflation appears to be under control and the economy remains quite resilient. So it remains to be seen if the Santa Claus rally has come early this year or uh, will this strength continue into December and beyond. But now that we are approaching the end of the year, I think it would be fun to look back at uh, some of the key market trends that shape this year. Uh, so my guest today is Todd Sohn, Managing Director, ETF and Technical Strategy at Stratigas Securities. He produces some awesome charts every week and I think he's the perfect guest to discuss these market trends of the year. Todd, welcome. Great to have you on the show. Hi Nina, thank you very much for the kind intro and I, and I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. So you're joining us on this show for the first time, so we'd love to hear a little bit about you. Yeah, so I work uh, for, as you mentioned, Strategus, we're a uh, macro research provider and I help handle our ETF research for our clients. And what I am most attracted by is that I find that ETFs are really a great lens into the psychology of markets, right? They they're, they're also offer investors a great low cost tax efficient vehicle. But if you're trying to understand what's going on in the more tactical sense, in the technical sense too, ETFs really come with great information. You can see where flows are going, where volumes are going, what's being ignored, what's being, uh, you know, what new products are being launched. I really think that helps uh, set the tone for how investors are viewing the markets overall. And my job is really to just tr attempt to tr uh, tie together the message of the market along with what's going on in the ETF industry. Great. So let's start with the, the biggest market story of this year, which is the outsized role of the Magnificent Seven stocks in this year's market performance. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA and Meta Platforms and Tesla, they now account for almost 29% of the S&P 500. And in fact, the NASDAQ 100 index had to undergo a special rebalance in July this year uh, because the combined market weight of these seven biggest stocks uh, that uh, went up to over 55%. And we often hear comparisons to Nifty 50 stocks in 1972 and also the internet bubble of the 2000. And you look at trends. So tell us, should investors worry about the dominance of these stocks? It's a great question and one I think is going to be significant importance. And I'm, and I'm glad that we're, we're recording this uh, in, in the beginning of December here because through November 30th, uh, the 10 largest stocks in the S&P 500 have provided 80% of the year-to-date gain. Now, that is the largest I have in the last 33 or so years of data. Um, now, importantly, it's actually down from over 100% a few months ago. So that's good. So that's a little bit of broadening. Um, but I would say that the companies today relative to the tech bubble are in much different shape, right? They've been able to handle the rise in interest rates much better. They have much more cash um, relative to their debt loads, where it's that's been a bit of a problem for companies down the cap scale. Um, now, can it continue? I, I, I would consider that a lot of the areas of the market have basically gone nowhere for the last year, even a year and a half. And so there is the risk for 2024 of those names to stall out while the rest of the market, the average stock, um, attempts to catch up. I, I think that's um, something to consider, especially with small caps. Small caps have underperformed by such a drastic amount this year. The Russell 2000 IWM is in the bottom decile of performance relative to the S&P 500 over the last 40 years. So there could be some mean reversion. 
Um, do I want to bet against the likes of Apple and Microsoft? Not necessarily, but just statistically speaking, the underperformance from under other areas of the market is really, really extreme. So consider that into the, the first half of 2024. Yes, uh, I hear a lot of experts talking about uh, that uh, these stocks have gone up too much too fast. So probably this rally in these mega cap tech stocks cannot continue in 2024. And again, they have many experts who are pointing out that these companies are cash rich as you mentioned uh, they have uh, very strong competitive positions and uh, those competitive positions will help them uh, sustain the high growth rates that they have been posting and as far as valuations are concerned uh, uh, many valuation experts have pointed out that forward p ratios have in fact come down uh, because of very strong expected earnings for these stocks. So it remains to be seen whether the rally in the mega cap tech stocks can continue in 2024. But as you mentioned, we did see a broadening of the market rally in November and some earlier beaten down areas uh, like small caps, banks, real estate, they did quite well. Uh, so please tell us about your thoughts on the recent outperformance of these uh, these areas like uh, small caps, value related companies, mm -hmm. etc. So I, I think what's really interesting from small caps, especially the ETF world, is that this hiking cycle, this rapid hiking cycle over the last year and a half has, has revealed a bit of the flaws with some of these small cap indices. Right. They have too many regional banks, they have too many boom and bust biotech type names. And so I think that's being reflected in ETFs where actively managed small cap strategies are only 7% of the AUM in that category, but have taken in about 40% of the flows this year. So there is this demand for having a professional at the wheel within the small cap space. Um, and you're seeing that in the performance rates, you're seeing it in the flows. Now, again, as I mentioned, the, the underperformance is at an extreme. And I would also say that it's it's been over 500 trading days since small caps hit a new high. That's only the seventh time since the mid-1970s that's happened. So more of these extremes are popping up. And I think when you have these underperforming areas, when you get any sort of improvement in market behavior, or if it's better than expected economic data, that makes the hurdle very low for them to rip higher basically right to start to outperform and, and value can be a part of that too especially when you have many investors who have likely piled into those mega cap growth names right they've ignored those other parts of the market until the bar is very very low for small caps for value um, type strategies to work from here it may not last a decade but it sure can last at least a few quarters from my own perspective. Right, right. We have also seen a lot of money go into cash-like instruments, uh, uh, table e like ETFs, uh, money market uh, funds have taken in, uh, more than a trillion dollar, dollars over the past year. Uh, but you pointed out in a recent note that there is opportunity cost in holding these cash-like instruments. So please tell us about your thoughts. And do you think that investors uh, are going to lighten up on the, on their cash exposure? And will that drive the stock market rally? That could boost the stock market rally because we have close to, a, to $6 trillion uh, sitting in money market funds as of now. Yeah, oh, that, that, it's an excellent question. And, and I've been obsessed with money market funds this year and I, I've called it a, a cycle defining chart that you have seen a trillion dollars, over $1 trillion go into money market vehicles since uh, the S&P low last October. And that's a pretty decent ratio relative to in, inflows into equity ETFs. And so while 5% yields, because it's been so long since investors have, have seen that, and have been able to um, expect that, it feels like the holy grail, I think, for a lot of investors out there that they're finally getting income on the fixed income portion of their portfolio. But keep in mind, opportunity cost is a real threat. I, I think we've all been so used to just buying stocks during the QE era that now everyone is shifting to either treasury bill ETFs or money market funds. Keep in mind that 5% is great, 
But it's a little bit more painful when the S&P is up 20% in the year and the NASDAQ 100, the QQQ, is up over 45%. And I, I suspect as the market continues to move higher and the threat of inflation perhaps continues to ebb, um, you should start to see what I would believe would be some sort of FOMO type move from investors. And the inflows to money market funds, I guess, would slow down, maybe even get some outflows. And that should translate into equity market inflows, right? I, I got to imagine that there's going to be a lot of investors out there who look at their statements and say that it was great for sitting at 5%, having no volatility, but the equity portion did much better. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, when they look at the performance of QQQ ETF or NVIDIA stock, they are probably going to ask why I was sitting in the money market fund and happy with 5%. So yes, uh, it would be interesting to watch whether we, some money will uh, come out of those money market funds and other cash-like uh, instruments and uh, uh, will be driving the stock market rally in 2024. Now let's talk about uh, other ETF fund flow trends. So earlier this year, flows into ETFs were rather lackluster, which was quite surprising because uh, last year, which was uh, terrible for stocks and bonds, ETFs gathered close to $600 billion. Uh, but uh, the the flow trends into ETFs that reversed in uh, November and ETFs took in over a hundred billion dollars in November. And uh, it seems that uh, trend may continue into December as well. Uh, so tell us about your key takeaways from uh, flow trends into ETFs and mutual funds as well, if you watch them. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, outside of money markets, which are kind of keeping the mutual fund industry afloat here, you're seeing a massive, massive switch. And I, I actually have some stats here that since Fed liftoff in March 2022, you have had $348 billion go into fixed income ETFs, right? I think fixed income is really the place where a lot of the shift is happening to now. Conversely, you've had $504 billion leave fixed income mutual funds. So that's an $850 billion swing for fixed income vehicles. And that, that's been happening for to equities for some time. A lot of money has left equity, actively managed equity mutual funds because of cost and performance. But the shift away out of the bond vehicles is a rather new phenomenon. And what I think is interesting is you're also finding the diversity of products within the fixed income ETF space is expanding. Right, We've spliced and diced equity up pretty well here, right? Whether it's a large cap index all the way down to very small niche thematic plays. But the amount of money that's now going into fixed income ETFs, you're seeing that splicing and dicing now go to bond ETFs. So rather than just the ag, I can buy a specific high yield sector. I can buy a specific duration, right? Those are very popular now. And so um, while mutual funds will always have a place in, in 401k plans and retirement type plans, there is a large chunk of money that is now leaving the space, I think, because of the Fed liftoff, because of the bottom in yields a few years ago. And, and during COVID, too, during that whole March 2020 episode, a lot of money left mutual funds, I guess, perhaps to tax loss harvest and go in the more tax efficient ETF vehicle. Um, I suspect it will continue. I feel like once the ETF gains steam, which we saw with equities, there's no stopping it, uh, at least until a better vehicle comes around, whatever that may be, however many decades. Right. Uh, inflows into bond ETFs have been really remarkable. And uh, in fact, uh, November was a great month for, for bonds. And uh, according to Bloomberg, it was the best month since the 1980s um, because the ag, the Bloomberg Ag Index that gained about 4%, 4.8% in November because yields plunged. Uh, but before that also, investors were putting in a lot of money into bond ETFs. We, we kept hearing about TLT, which is now down about 12% year to date, uh, and it has attracted more than 23 billion in inflows this year. So that was really remarkable. And uh, the Vanguard total bond market ETF, ticker symbol BNT, that recently crossed 
100 billion in assets, and it became the first bond ETF to reach that milestone. So tell us a little bit about your thoughts on why investors were putting so much money into bond ETFs, even though it appears that bonds are on track for a third consecutive year of losses. Yeah, I, I think part of it comes down to the to the yield. Right? Bond investors see the, the 4 to 5% yield now that some of their funds can get, and they're very attracted to that. It's something they haven't seen in a really long time. Now, T TLT has been a fascinating experiment this year. I think on one hand, there are certainly flows going there from larger allocators that maybe they need to rebalance their long duration position. I think that's fair because the position has been declining. But what I also find interesting is that if you look at the volume of TLT, the daily dollar volume traded has really expanded in the last two to three months. Uh, to almost record like daily trading of five, six billion dollars worth. And so that suggests to me not only are you having large asset allocators come into exposure there, but perhaps retail in a way is trying to bottom fish TLT, right? And when long duration, um, the, the key thing about long duration is when the Fed stops hiking, that's really the time to step in and buy long duration because rates are on hold and perhaps going to decline. Um, and because of the ultra sensitivity of TLT, you should look for an increase. So I think that's what's happening. It's more embracement of the bond ETFs as an investment vehicle by both institutions and retail. Um, and it also comes down to this opportunity that yields haven't been at this area in quite some time. So a lot of investors want to be involved here. They want to balance out that magnificent ex seven exposure with something a little bit more stable. The one other item to keep in mind, though, is that when you buy TLT, you are adding more volatility to a portfolio. TLT basically has the same standard deviation returns as the S&P 500. I think that might get overlooked, especially when you can get a similar yield on much shorter duration type vehicles, of course, without the price appreciation. But just be mindful that you are adding more volatility when you buy long duration type uh, exposure such as TLT or ZROZ, right? That's the one tricky thing that I, I do want investors to remember going forward. Right, investors should be aware of the volatility, and particularly when the the yields are so attractive at the shorter end as well. Then probably it makes sense to keep that in mind that the amount of risk that they are taking by investing in these longer duration bonds. Now another. Uh, trend that we have seen is the rise of active ETFs, and you did allude to it, uh, the trend the, to the trend earlier. And uh, uh, these active ETFs, they have received an outsized portion of inflows this year, and most of the new uh, ETFs being launched this year are active ETFs. We have seen many uh, legacy mutual fund uh, managers. Uh, they are entering ETFs, uh, the ETF uh, the industry. They are converting their mutual funds into ETFs. They are launching ETF clones of their successful mutual funds. So among these leg legacy active managers, we have seen active ETFs uh, from the the likes of Newberger Birming, uh, Alliance Bursting, T. Rowe Price, Federated Hermes, Matthews Asia, GMO was one of the recent ones who launched um, uh, their active ETF. So tell us about uh, your thoughts on the rise of active ETFs and also uh, increased launches from uh, legacy, uh, legacy mutual fund managers and investment advisors. Yeah, it, it, this is this is almost the evolution of of two different aspects. One being the flows, because flows are clearly going to ETFs and away from mutual funds for the most part. And then the second the second part of it, I think, comes down to index exposure. So legacy managers who have active products, they they want to be in the ETF space because that's where the money is flowing. That's where client demand is. But they can also bring this proposition of if you are worried about tech exposure in your S&P 500 index or a big drawdown going forward at some point, well, then they can be there to ideally handle the volatility and right, adjust the portfolio as they see. Now, they, they may do it with different types of strategies, more systematic, more thematic and whatnot. But I think that those two ideas are why you're seeing such high 
uh, concentration of, of active ETF launches. And and the, the interesting parts are you have covered call strategies, right? Clients are demanding income to help cushion any losses. Buffered ETFs, I think, makes sense for a great portion of the demographics here in the U.S., especially those who are approaching retirement. Maybe they have scars from 2000 and 2008 and want to protect themselves from any major drawdown while keeping their equity exposure. Uh, so I, I think those are the two main ideas there. And then along with the legacy managers, you're seeing investment advisors, smaller investment advisors, bring their strategies maybe from an SNA, SMA into an ETF. It could be for tax efficiency or it could be to widen out their business, right? If you're offering an ETF, you're opening up to anyone out there rather than just your immediate clients. The clients will know you better as a person and as a business, but if the strategy performs well, you might be able to open up yourself to an entirely other market of participants that you maybe never thought about catering to as an investment advisor. So I think that's another you know, undiscovered perhaps aspect of, of some of these smaller funds, uh, smaller companies launching these new ETFs here, that there's a benefit for them if they can find the traction in a very competitive industry too. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned covered call strategies because that has been another very interesting phenomenon we, ha we have seen uh, because of the enormous success of JP, which is the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF. We have seen so many copycat ETFs based on covered call strategies, which recently entered the market. And we have seen uh, in uh, different versions of uh, options, options based income ETFs also coming to market. For example, zero to a day to expiry uh, options ETFs have also entered the market and they have been quite popular with investors. So it's been a phenomenon which uh, we'll be watching very closely. So now, talking a little bit more about the new ETFs this year, 2023 has been a blockbuster year for ETF launches, and we are on track to surpass the all-time annual record of ETF launches, which was set in 2021. Uh, now, uh, among these ETFs, some are quite interesting. So tell us about your thoughts on uh, this record number of ETF launches and uh, any new ETFs that caught your eye. Yeah, and I, I've taken to calling the these this overload of covered call and optional overlay strategies exchange exchange traded uh, income rather than exchange traded funds, just, you know, <laughs> humorously, humorously. Um, but every once in a while, when you get a successful product like Jeppy, inevitably there is other supply that comes to the market. It's similar to a few years ago when you had Arc success. A lot of issuers came out with innovation and disruption strategies, and it's just kind of how the cycle goes and there will be some successful competitors and whatnot, but uh, more often than not, it's hard to keep pace with the, the first mover there. So um, of other new funds that caught my eye this year, and I, I think some of the, a, the AI uh, plays, the um, chat from Roundhill was really impressive. I also like what Roundhill did with the Magnificent Seven fund. They changed their the marketing of, of BIGT, Big Tech, to Magnificent Seven. I think that was really smart to take advantage um, of what seems to be a, a little bit of a zeitgeist moment in terms of the indices. Um, and then also the the onslaught of crypto strategies. It seems like the industry is really building towards this moment of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Uh, I have kind of kept myself out of there in terms of the, the details of when that will happen. But ARK has a whole new suite based on that. Uh, we have the whole bunch of Ethereum type launches that came by. So that's another brand newish, right? It's been around for what, 10 years or so, asset class and brand new to the ETF space that investors can cater towards and add to their portfolios. And then one other one that really stood out to me recently was from Amplify and, and I guess their parent company, Samsung, it was based on the uh, SOFR rate. So we've had short, -term, we've had uh, target duration ETFs based on the treasury curve, whether it's three months to 30 years. But this is the first one based on SOFR. So Another interesting way to play 5% type yields, um, and I'm, I'm curious to see if that will be um, will be successful. Uh, but there have been so many other launches this year that it, it's almost challenging to find what are the most the 10 most interesting out there because 
um, of how much talent is now within this industry too, as, as you mentioned with some of these legacy providers coming into the space. Right, uh, those are some of the very interesting new ETFs and I like both of them, Ch Chat and Max, Magnific Magnificent 7. And uh, yeah, we'll be watching whether they can continue their uh, spectacular performance in the new year as well. Now let's talk about your favorite ETFs for 2024 and not uh, an investment recommendations, but uh, uh, is there, are there any ETFs that you think investors might want to consider for the new year or might want to watch in the, in, in the new year? Yeah, I, I, a few that stand out to me. Um, I always say, if you're looking to, to do a diagnostic check on the market, take a look at what the equally weighted indices are doing. So, for example, EQAL, that's the equal weight Russell 1000. If you want to balance your portfolio from, say, the cap weight S&P 500 and the tech exposure, that's a good route to go because you're getting more of a, a value tilt, a tilt towards industrials and financials. Um, the industrials themselves, XLI, another area that is very good and has been a leader, and we have a manufacturing boom here in the U.S., and so... That's another great counter to um, mega cap growth. Uh, and I, I also take, take a look at abroad. I, I like the idea of unbundling international exposure where pick a country rather than buying the MSCIE from MSCIEM. So Japan stands out to me. Um, that seems like a very strong bull market. I know I've been feel like investors have been burned there for years and years and years, but this one seems a little bit different because of the governance changes that are going on with that in that in that industry. And so I like that as an international um, representation. And then in small caps, I, I don't love the IWM because of the construction, and so I like playing the active route with something like AVUV from Advantis or even DFAS from from dimensional where they have a little bit of different tilt rather than just blindly going with the passive index. And then lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that it's going to be an election year and my colleagues here at Strategas do have a policy focused ETF SAGP for whatever that's uh, for what that's worth. And that um, tends to play the more lobbying aspects of Washington DC. It's a different spin on a, an ETF, uh, one that really isn't out there. And so, uh, for any investors interested in that too, I, I'd feel uh, I'd just would be remiss if I did not mention it too, given where we're going. Right. Uh, so please tell us a little bit more about the policy ETF that you mentioned. Sure, sure. And, and the ticker is SAGP, and it's run by my my teammates in Washington D.C., Dan Clifton and Courtney Rosenberger. And what they do is is select the uh, I believe it's a hundred stocks that lobby the most. Right, it's uh, to simplify that uh, to simplify the the, the theme there, um, and so it's a different way. It's almost a different factor to weight your portfolio rather than market cap or dividend weighted or some other fundamentally weighted fund. It weights by how much some companies are lobbying. So you'll get healthcare exposure because drug companies tend to lobby a lot. You'll get a lot of defense exposure because those companies will lobby for more spending. Right, um, and so it's a little bit of a different spin. And then your traditional ETFs, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of those topics will be in focus uh, over the next uh, 11 months or so as the election cycle really picks up. Yeah, totally agree with you. That's a very interesting strategy <laughs> for the election year. And oh, yes. all other picks are also very, very interesting. Uh, we'll have to leave it there, Todd. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your insights. Thank you very much. That was Todd Soon. Now let's quickly recap some of the ETF tickers that we discussed today. So among the new ETFs, uh, he talked about CHAT, Roundhill, Generative AI and Technology ETF, and the Magnificent 7 ETF from Roundhill, the ticker symbol is MAGS. Uh, we had Roundhill on the show to talk about these ETFs, chat and Max. Uh, so please listen to that deep episode if you want to learn more about these ETFs. Now, among the ETFs that he's watching, or EDF picks for 2024, he talked about the equal weighted Russell 1000 index uh, ETF. This is the ticker symbol is EQ. 
A-L. This is by Invesco. He's also watching the industrial ETF. The ticker symbol is XLI. Among the small caps, he mentioned the one by Avantis. The ticker symbol is AVUV. And the one by Dimensional is DFAS. He mentioned Japan. He did not mention any ETF, but uh, the ones that I like are DXJ. If you want a currency hedged ETF for Japan, it is by Wisdom Tree. Wisdom Tree hedged equity, Japan hedged equity ETF. And if you want an unhedged ETF, so if you believe that the dollar's surge against the yen is over, then take a look at BB. JP, which is by JP Morgan, or EWJ, which is by iShares. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.